Good morning, Harvest. Welcome to Church Online. My name is Donnie, and as is a custom, we'll be reading through the Bible. So would you turn with me to 2 Samuel 13, verse 34. It reads, But Absalom fled, and the young man who kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming from the road behind him by the side of the mountain. And Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come. As your servant said, so it has come about. And as soon as he had finished speaking, behold, the king's son came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also and all his servants wept bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. Sends the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that not only is it um, to be teached, but it's to be learned from. It is to be read. It, it has a human side of it, something that we can relate to. I pray that as we continue to uh, grow as Christians, that we would never take for granted your word, that we would never choose to leave out parts that we don't like, or that make us uncomfortable, but that we would grow deeper and, and long for understanding why you allowed those to be. I pray that as the service takes form, that you would lead. I put all of this into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Harvest. Would you join us and stand and worship in song as we sing of the hope found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Put your hands together wherever you are. Let's sing out to our God. It's found in you, it's found in you, 
Hallelujah. Jesus. with Harvest Bible Chapel, Turks and Caicos Islands. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us online today. Now, if you are in need of prayer or you have any concerns, you'd like to speak with anybody, a member of our ministerial staff, then please call 333-2009 and someone would be happy to talk with you and to pray with you over anything that you would like to. Now, when it comes to tithes and offerings, you're going to see some banking information on the screen with two bank account numbers. And that's because the one, 731360, relates 
to our ministry efforts here in the Turks and Caicos Islands, just our, our regular upkeep of our ministry here. Uh, the other, we are in the midst of uh, assisting and having the opportunity to participate in relief efforts in St. Vincent and, and the Grenadines. And so, uh, as you are aware, Pastor Kenyatta and Divi are, are in St. Vincent, and any money that uh, is donated through this account goes directly uh, to the people that need it the most, whether it's through cases of water or food or whatever needs that they are seeing on the ground there. So that bank account number is also there. Both of these accounts are at Scotiabank. So if you can participate or you would feel led to, please do so as you are led. Uh, this past week or two, our discipleship groups, uh, which is our small group ministry, uh, we meet throughout the week various times. We've been winding up a study on the book of Esther. And it's really been uh, a, an amazing time. For a lot of us, it's, it's a book that uh, we've studied many times. For others, it was the first time. But two things coming out of it. Uh, when you think about how God is at work, even when we don't see it, especially when we don't see it, and when things are really, really tough, it is good to be encouraged and know, and what we know from the book of Esther, that God is behind the scenes, working things out for good for his people. That's number one. Number two is for us to consider our role in this time and this place. God can use us wherever we are when we are willing to be used. And I'd like to use those two things as prayer points today. So if you would join me in prayer, let's lift that up in Jesus' name. Okay, let's pray. Father God, you are good. You are gracious and holy and kind, and we are so thankful for your word that draws us closer to you and gives us a glimpse of who you are. Father God, we know that in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of everything that's going on around us, whether it's in our relationships, in our homes, in our workplace, in our communities, in our country, Lord God, you are at work behind the scenes fulfilling your purpose and your will for your people. God, we can't see it many times. We cannot see it. As we look ahead, we wonder how things are ever going to change or get any better. But instead of looking ahead, God, we need to be looking behind and at your faithfulness. You've been so good to us, God, in the past, and we're not going to stop doubting you now, God. We are not. And so we are trusting you that you are working things out in St. Vincent, and we are trusting you that you are working things out in our lives here in the Turks and Caicos. And for wherever people are watching online church today, God, you are working all things out for good for those who love you and who are called according to your purpose, God. And so we entrust that and we are thankful. Father God, also too, we know that faith without works is dead. And you have placed each one of us as believers right where we are for a specific reason, for a purpose, to declare your glory, to show your love, to extend a hand of fellowship, to extend a hand of friendship, um, a hand of forgiveness, Lord God, to those around us. You have a purpose for each one of us, God. I pray, Father, for the hearts and minds of those who are watching, that they would seek your face, that they would draw near to you and say, God, use me where I'm at, where whatever it is that you would have me do at this time in this place, Lord God, use me for your glory. We thank you, God, for your goodness, your faithfulness, your kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us through our ministry updates. Right now, would you join us as we get back into worship and song, as we sing to our God who is worthy of praise. Wounds of the Son of Man, stories of a Savior, holiness with human hands, treasure for the You are worthy 
Savior, my refuge, my hiding place. You are my helper, my healer, my rested redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You are my hope in the shadows, my strength in the explanation. I believed. But then things fell apart. I witnessed the betrayal that led to the cruel march to Calvary and his agonizing crucifixion. I survived, but everyone I knew scattered. My world collapsed. Then came news of the empty tomb, the very first Easter. But I resisted. The image of his broken, lifeless body was still burned into my memory. I experienced his death that I couldn't believe. Not until I see the scars with my own eyes and touch them with my own hands, I told the others. I wasn't ready to put my trust in something again. But Jesus came to me. He knew my doubts. He even named them. But he wasn't angry. He didn't rebuke me or dismiss me. He looked at me with those familiar eyes. 
and offered me his scarred hands inside. In that moment, I experienced his resurrection, and I believed. I know firsthand it's difficult to believe in what you can't see. And yet all around you are people whose lives and stories have scars that bear witness to the meaning of Easter. Yes, these people have been wounded, but they've experienced redemption and healing through Jesus. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were meant to rescue the doubters, the debtors, and the broken, people like you and me. He met my doubts with grace and love, and he only asked one thing of me, believe. Good morning to everyone, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel. My name is Marcus Francis, and it gives me indeed a great pleasure to be able to share with you again from God's Word. Last week, we examined one post-resurrection experience, namely the walk to Emmaus, recorded in Luke chapter 24. Um, this week, we are going to explore another of those experiences. But before I do, I am going to share three statements, and I need you to give feedback to tell me whether it is true, the statement is true or false. The machine that makes candy, cotton candy, was invented by a dentist, true or false? You say false, you say true, which one it is? All those in favor of true? That's correct, that statement is true. The shortest commercial flight in the world lasts just 57 seconds. Is that true or false? Most people say false. No, the answer is true. Um, elephant can also hear with their feet. They use it to detect distant noises. Is that true or false? All right, some people say true, some people say false. The answer is true. Interesting how these facts are all true, but are sometimes difficult to believe just on the surface. So that our focus and message today is about believing. As Jesus invites us to believe. Our text is John 20. And we are interested in from verse 24 to 29. And I'm reading and I invite you to get your Bibles open and to join me in this text. And keep your Bibles open because we, we read and we preach from God's word. Now Thomas... One of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were, were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. As we begin today's message, I want us to know already that Jesus lovingly meets the sincere heart where it is, but points it to where it needs to be. Observe with me from the passage the following. Observe with me first what I call Thomas's confession of unbelief. In our text, Jesus makes another appearance to the disciples the same day of his resurrection. Verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. 
verse 19. Interesting that as the news of the resurrection emerged, the disciples' responses were varied from fright to flight. But now in this appearance, we see a common expression of gladness. Verse 20 reads, Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So we see a common understanding and a common acceptance and recognition of the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. And he did exactly what he prophesied would happen. He is now risen from the dead, and they are glad. Interestingly, that the vast majority of them are responding with this gladness and this joy, although they are locked in the room because of fear of the Jews. Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, was missing when he appeared. But when he came, his brothers told him that Jesus had risen and that he had appeared to them. But Thomas did not believe, verse 25. But he said to them, unless, unless I see. And he stated what he wanted to see. And he ends it by saying, I will never believe. Thomas's confession of unbelief. I will never believe, he said. Thomas sought to address his doubt by establishing the conditions upon which he would believe that Jesus was alive. Verse 25. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my fingers or my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. He sought to address and to deal with his doubt about whether it was Jesus that, that was risen indeed by stating clearly what he would like to see. His choice of evidence was in his mind the most compelling of all pieces of evidence. You see, anyone could look and claim to be Jesus, but in Thomas's mind, not anyone would have had nail punctures in his hands and side and be alive appearing to different people. Thomas needed proof beyond reasonable doubt that it was Jesus. Verse 25, unless I see and place my finger, I will never believe. He, he, want, he wanted proof beyond reasonable doubt that it was Jesus. And his ultimate proof in his mind were the marks of the nails and the mark of the sword in Jesus' body. Not only was Thomas' choice of evidence in his mind the most compelling, but Thomas' choice of evidence was most commanding. Unless I see it. And unless I place my hands into his side, very commanding. Even if Jesus were to come here with the punctures in his hands and feet, and Thomas was not able to verify for himself, perhaps he would not believe. But also, note with me that his choice was evidence was not only compelling and commanding, but it was very personal. The choice of evidence was very personal. Look at the pronouns in the passage. Thomas said, unless I see it, unless I place my, my hands in it, I will never believe. It was what Thomas wanted. But Thomas was sincere about his unbelief, and this belief that Jesus was alive. He was sincere about it. And he sought to address his doubt, his disbelief, by getting compelling evidence that Jesus, that it was Jesus who was there. Jesus lovingly meets the sincere heart where it is, but points it to where it needs to be. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love how Jesus dealt with his disciples post the resurrection. I see love just permeating in every response that Jesus gave. You remember last week in our message, these disciples, two of them, 
walking down Emma's Road and Jesus comes alongside them in a loving way. He engages in conversation in a loving way. He stays with them all night in a loving way. He points them to scripture and brings them into worship in a loving way. And then their eyes will open. Jesus lovingly meets the sincere heart where it is, but points it to where it ought to be. Verse 26 tells us, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. I ask you to observe with me first what I call Thomas's confession of unbelief. But observe with me second, Jesus' loving confrontation. Eight days later, he appeared again and greeted the disciples the same as before. Peace be with you. You see, that was a significant greeting. Because in, in Hebrew, the word used for peace, shalom, means not only the absence of conflict, but also wholeness and completeness. It means nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing lacking. So that when he said, peace be unto you, he was reminding his disciples and, and just declaring to them that I, Jesus, I am the Prince of Peace. And those who are found in me will experience a peace that passeth all understanding. Those who abide in me will enjoy a peace that no one can, that the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. He greeted them in this powerful greeting, peace be unto you. You see, that greeting is significant. Because the disciples were afraid of the Jews and the actions that they may have been contemplating against them. Because Jesus' body is now gone. The, the leaders are upset. They are angry. They need to cover up this story. Another portion of the New Testament records that, that they paid people to say that his disciples came and stole his body. So every, every the atmosphere is tense with fear and trepidation, and, and, and overly concerned for their safety. And Jesus comes in their midst and says, Peace be unto you. Wholeness and completeness. Because I'm here. I'm Jesus. Jesus was reiterating what he already said to them as recorded in John 14 and 27, when he said to them, Peace I live with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What a comforting greeting. What a loving greeting to people who are fearful, who are locked behind doors, who are wondering and worrying about what the authorities might do, what the authorities might be contemplating. In the midst of that, Jesus comes and makes a statement and, and, and it falls right in line with what he had said earlier to the disciples. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus then looks to Thomas and in a loving and direct way, he invites Thomas to satisfy his desire and need for personal verification of the risen Jesus. Verse 27 says now, he looks to Thomas. And he does not rebuke Thomas. He does not scold Thomas. He does not ignore Thomas being in the room. But rather, he addresses him directly. And he said to him in verse 27, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Jesus lovingly invited Thomas to believe in him, the Son of God. He said to him in verse 27, as a loving means of encouragement, he said, do not disbelieve, but believe. 
What a word of encouragement from Jesus to Thomas. What love in action. As, as Jesus now comes um, right before his, his disciple Thomas and lovingly confronts him and lovingly engages him and lovingly pulls him to where he wants him to believe, to believe. Jesus was reminding Thomas that unbelief is a sin. John 16 and verse 8, Jesus had said to them on a previous occasion that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, will, is come, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Listen to verse 9. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. So Jesus was encouraging Thomas, says, do not disbelieve, but believe because unbelief is a sin. Jesus lovingly was encouraging Thomas to move from head knowledge to heart conviction. To move from what he had heard, what he had listened to, to now having a deep personal conviction about who Jesus was and who Jesus is. Jesus was lovingly inviting Thomas to recognize that the word of God is true and that what he was experiencing was the fulfillment of the prophetic word. You see, saints of God, Jesus was moving Thomas along the spectrum of his faith from questioning and doubting to planting his faith firmly in Jesus. You see, Jesus knew and even if Thomas had satisfied what he felt was the ultimate evidence, he could still have doubt and could have left his presence with an unwavering faith. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that just seeing the prince and putting his finger in it and his hand in his side, Jesus knew Thomas' heart and he knew exactly where he was. That's why Jesus said to him, come, do this, do that. But here is the bigger point. Jesus said, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas, believe it is I. Jesus lovingly meets the sincere heart where it is, but points it to where it needs to be. As Thomas opened his heart to the Lord and believed, his response was different but powerful. Verse 28 says, Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. A profound response in light of the prophecies that Jesus had spoken of himself recorded earlier by John. In chapter 3 and verse 14, John writes, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 8, 28, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And then in John chapter 12 and verse 32, it reads, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. My Lord and my God. What a powerful response. Two commentators, Gil and Barnes, collectively wrote this. They sum up their, their, their views on this portion. It does not appear that Thomas has gone as far as putting his hand in the punctures. Rather, gave a powerful confession upon seeing Jesus. Jesus asked him, Do, did you believe because you saw me? So that it, we, 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 we don't know for sure if Thomas actually went to place his hands. From the time he saw Jesus, the conviction came and he said, my Lord and my God. The word, my Lord, the words, my Lord and my God, were confirmation of his belief and not a statement of surprise. That conviction... And that confession solidified his belief in the deity of Christ, as John wrote in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, verse 2. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
Verse 14 tells us this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father. Full of grace and truth. My Lord and my God is a statement affirming the deity of Jesus Christ. That he was Lord and master over all. But he was the great God. As Paul puts it, great is the mystery of godliness. As John puts it, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Thomas saw the glory of God right before his eyes. And his, his statement is a reflection of how convicted he, came at, he became at that point. And his confession reflects an affirmation of his faith. My Lord, my Lord, and my God. And God, of which he was fully assured from his omniscience, which he had given a full proof of, and from the power that went along with his words to his heart. And from a full conviction, he now had his resurrection from the dead. By calling him my Lord and my God, Thomas asserts his interest in him as his Lord and his God, which denotes his subjection to him, his affection for him, and his faith in him. What a powerful development that we are seeing here this morning, saints of God, from a man who said, unless I put my hand not just see, but put my hand in the, in the nail prints and in the side. I will not believe. Two, seeing Jesus eight days later. And when he sees Jesus, we, 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 do not, we are not sure if he got a chance to put his fingers and his hand in the side. What we do know is that when he saw Jesus and Jesus encouraged him to believe, the next expression we have recorded is my Lord and my God. I own him as my Lord and my master. I recognize him as the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus lovingly meets the sincere heart where it is, but will point it to where it needs to be. Jesus' loving reminder to Thomas is, is found in verse 29. He's reminding Thomas of the powerful life of faith we are called to live. Jesus ended that encounter with a powerful lesson on the pilgrim's walk, which now speaks to you and to me. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 reminds us, For we walk by faith and not by sight. You see, friends, I want you to know right where you are, if you have never trusted Jesus, there is a message for you. If you're wavering, there is a message for you. If you're firm in faith, there is a message for you. Jesus lovingly comes to meet you and I where we are. And through this message, by his Holy Spirit, he's again coming to meet you where you are to bring you to where you need to be. So I ask you the question, now as we apply this, this powerful story, how is your faith on the stability scale? There are three aspects on this scale, or three, de three degrees on this scale. The first degree is, I have never believed Jesus for saving me. Are you on that first level? The second one is, I have believed, but sometimes I waver in my faith. And at the other end of that scale, we have my faith is anchored firmly in him, and I am believing. Pause for a minute. And as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, answer the question, where are you on the faith scale? Do you fall in the first quadrant of that scale that says, I've never believed Jesus, for salvation? Do you, are you on the second tier of that scale that says, I have believed, but my faith in the past couple months, in the past year, in the past three years, have, have waned, have been, is on very shaky ground? Or are you at that scale that says, 
My faith is firmly anchored in him. I address the three groups as we apply. First of all, for those who have never believed in Jesus for saving them, might I suggest to us that like Pilate, we must all answer the question. Pilate asked the question, what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah when Jesus was brought to him? That's the question. What am I to do with Jesus? And that's the question you might be asking me today. Preacher, I hear you. I have never trusted Jesus Christ for my saving faith. What am I supposed to do with this Jesus Christ? Well, there is just two words I have to say to you in response. Believe him. Believe him. You see, the sin of unbelief is not merely ignorance. Rather, it is willfully refusing God's free gift of forgiveness for sin. Of truth, my brothers and sisters, forgiveness is conditional upon belief. Because if you do not believe, you will not confess. And if you do not confess, you will not be forgiven. Jesus lovingly left you and I his written word so that our belief in him could be informed. Often people criticize us as believers and try to suggest that, that we have no foundation, we have no grounding, we have no basis for a belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. And I say, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. Everything we need for life and godliness is found in Jesus. And God has given us his written word. And his word informs us. His word instructs us. His word invites us to follow Jesus Christ. Follow with me in John 20 or text and the 31st verse it says but these things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name that's it so Jesus lovingly left us his written word so whereas we do not have the privilege of Thomas to have seen him and have touched his hand if we needed to and touch his side. We have the powerful word of God that tells us all of the experiences, but instructs us as to how we can come to faith in Jesus Christ and how we can live a victorious life in Jesus Christ. So that if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior, and you're asking questions, we encourage you to ask the questions. But here's what we also encourage you to do. Search the scriptures, for in it you will find eternal life. If you look for Jesus outside of the scripture, he's reflected in nature. God is reflected in nature. If you're looking for Jesus in another book, you're not going to find him. Because Jesus and his life and purpose and every plan God has for us is written in the word of God. Don't go finding and investigating Jesus from sources outside of the one source the divine God has given us the scriptures. For therein you will find life. Jesus not only have left us the written word that John tells us has been written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life everlasting. But he also lovingly calls us to himself. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe, here's that word again, what Jesus said to Thomas. Don't disbelieve, believe. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all and rich to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then in John chapter 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. 
and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whosoever believes have eternal life. So that friends, listening via media, the Father has allowed you to hear his word again today. And by his Holy Spirit, he's ministering and convicting you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's convicting you of your unbelief. You see, friends, your inquiry mind has, play, has a place and is useful. Your head knowledge may be okay, but it's insufficient. You, the, you might be living in fear. Do not allow fear. People, cares of this life, or even the questions you have to hinder you from believing. Thomas did not allow the external circumstances to, to keep him from moving from that place of unbelief to that place of belief. When Jesus invited him, saying, do not disbelieve, but believe, he saw Jesus and there was a conviction of heart and his confession was, my Lord and my God. Today, as you listen to these words and as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, the encouragement is believe in Jesus as the only one that can save you from your sins. Yes, there are many questions that you may have that are not answered at this time. And yes, you are worried about this and concerned about that. But here is the first and most important step to take, to believe and trust Jesus for your soul's salvation. And when you do, and you are born again into the kingdom of God, he will give you his Holy Spirit. Spirit, and he taught his disciples that when the spirit of truth is come, he will lead and guide you into all truth so that the questions you have will be answered. But Jesus is inviting you to come to know him as Lord and Master, as your Lord and your God. And then the Holy Spirit will come and will teach you all things. So that the invitation is to come. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart, but confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. If you have never believed Jesus for saving you, well, today can be your day. I repeat Jesus' invitation. Open your heart, confess with your mouth, and believe. You see, friends, we pause to give you a moment to do that right now. You don't have to do anything else but bow where you are and pray and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, that you died, buried, and rose again triumphantly, and you did that so that I could have life and have it more abundantly. And today I come confessing my sins and trusting you for salvation. And if you say this prayer out of a sincere heart, the Bible says you are saved. And if you have said this prayer, feel free to reach out to us at the Harvest Bible Chapel through the phone number on the screen and the email so that we can rejoice with you because the Bible says heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. And then Romans 1 is so beautiful. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to address the second tier on that scale. I have believed, but sometimes I waver in my faith. Jesus, in his continuous loving way, is speaking to those who are wavering, and this is what he says to you through his word. These things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The question I ask you today, if you're wavering, is simply this. What are your potential distractions, your potential exposures, or what are you at risk of being deceived by? What is causing your faith to waver? And as we explore scripture, we will learn that we, we, we allow our faith to waver when we expose ourselves to several distractions out there. We allow our faith to waver when we allow people an opportunity in our lives to speak things that are not sound doctrine. We waver in our faith when we are not consistent in the disciplines of the faith. When our lives are not daily being surrendered to God. We waver in our faith when we, we have not found our roots in scripture. When our roots are in people and roots are found in isms and in right, other men's writings and not in scripture. We find our faith becoming shaky and we find that our faith wanes. Our faith wanes when we do not spend time in prayer. The lack of growth. As children in the church, we often sang that little song, read your Bible, pray every day, and you will grow, grow, grow. Don't read your Bible, forget to pray, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. The question I ask you today is, what is causing your faith to waver? Jesus is loving you, asking you to take inventory of what's causing you to waver and to bring it to the cross of Jesus Christ. Let him deal with it, and you get on in the work of believing. Let Jesus deal with the cares of this life, and you get on with the work of believing. Let Jesus deal with, with all the people around you who are trying to be negative and discourage you, and you get on with the work of believing. Let, let, Jesus is asking you to take inventory. Let him deal with the neighbor and with the co-worker and with the other people and problems around you, and you get on with the work of believing. Jesus is, is inviting you to bring those fears and laid at the cross and rise up and get on with the business of walking in believing. He is asking us, he's given us his cross where we can lay things down in prayer. He's asking us to come, he's inviting us to come and to lay our lives before him. And like Thomas, say, Lord, I want a faith that is rooted in you and in your word. I want a faith that is assured, as we saw last week, in scripture and in worship and in connection with the brethren fellowship. Lord, we want a faith that is active and dynamic and is spreading your word. He is inviting us to come to an altar where we can lay our lives down and we can rise up like Thomas and declare, my Lord and my God. What is it that you find as you take that inventory? As you find it, I invite you to pause in prayer and to bring it to the cross. And then lastly, I address the group on the extreme end of the spectrum that says, my faith is anchored in him. Well, I have one word for you. Keep believing. If your faith is anchored in Jesus, keep believing, keep strengthening that faith. This is what Jude 1 and verse 20 writes. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. If your faith is anchored in him, then the word today is keep in the walk of believing, keep in the walk of growing, keep in the walk of praying, keep in the walk of keeping yourselves in the love of God, keep in the walk of being in Bible study and small group, keep in the walk of fellowship with the brethren, keep in the walk of fasting, keep in the walk of sharing your faith, sharing the gospel, keep in your walk of serving. If you are already grounded in him, keep believing in spite of what will come your way. The trying of your faith will work. Patience and patience will experience hope and hope will never put a shame because the love of God is spread in your heart. Keep Walking and keep believing. Because Jesus 
lovingly meets the sincere heart where it is and will point us to where we need to be. Wherever you are on that scale, Jesus has met you there today. And if you have never trusted him, he wants to bring you to that salvation experience. If you're wavering, he's right next to you and he wants to help you anchor your faith in him. That's where he's pointing you to, to an anchor in Jesus. And if you're anchored in Jesus, he's encouraging you to keep walking, keep believing, keep believing, keep believing. We end with a video of a powerful testimony of a lady who was not just an unbeliever, but atheistic in her views and how Jesus brought her to a place where she could trust him. Let's look at this video and then we'll come back for prayer. You know, growing up, I didn't really think too much about God. I didn't believe that he existed, even when I was a very young girl. I remember being about eight or nine years old and I was spending a couple weeks in the summer at my grandmother's house. And there was one night when I was laying in bed next to her. She's laying next to me, just asleep, breathing peacefully. And I just started thinking about what it'd be like to die. I started imagining um, just nothingness and blackness and just um, eternity of nothing. And that scared me. I just, I, I lived with this constant fear of death. It impacted me every single day. I worried about getting hit by a car. I worried about um, getting some kind of illness. I worried about fires. I just, I constantly lived in the fear of death. This carried through into how I lived in high school and college. You know, most people that don't believe in God, I think kind of go in immoral direction. But for me, because of this overriding fear of death, I made different choices. I chose not to smoke, not to drink, not to do drugs. Honestly, not because I thought these things were sinful, but just because I was afraid I was gonna die. It impacted me um, every single day. I was a strong evolutionist and absolutely, um, now looking back, I would have called myself an evangelical atheist. I was trying as hard to convert people to be an atheist as they were to convert me to believe in God. So I ended up um, taking a student teaching position for my last quarter in college in St. Louis. And um, after being in St. Louis for a couple weeks, I got a phone call out of the blue from a girlfriend. And she said, hey Kim, I'm getting married and I really want you to come. So um, against all of my better judgment, I went to this wedding and that day um, I met a young man who was willing to um, go head to head with me on these debates. He didn't run away when, um, when I was challenging his beliefs and he was willing to um, spend the hours of conversation that it took for me to, um, I don't know, I was just very argumentative and, and a complete debater. So we kept talking and one night he said something to me about being saved. And honestly, I didn't know what the word saved meant. And so I just said to him, well, what is it? What does this mean to be saved? And it was the first time in my life that I'd heard the gospel. I was 21 years old. I had grown up in the Midwest. I had Christian grandparents. I had even gone to a Christian college. And to tell you the truth, I didn't know that Jesus was God in the flesh. I didn't know why we celebrated Easter or Christmas. I didn't know um, the famous Bible verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I didn't know that famous children's song, Jesus Loves Me. So that night, um, this young man told me the gospel about placing my faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, um, confessing my sins and repenting of them and turning away from um, a life of, of self to a life of service to my Lord Jesus Christ. And um, that day I had just mustard seed sized faith, but I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And at that point, Honestly, my life completely changed. 
Um, the, the biggest thing that changed for me is that when I read the Bible, and before people had shown me things in the Bible and I always just thought, this is a fairy tale. I can't believe that people believe this stuff. And when I read the Bible, I thought, wow, this is real. It had power for me in a way that I had, I had never seen before. So I began um, reading the Bible and seeing the truth that was in the scriptures. After becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, I continued to meet with this young man. Our conversations changed. Um, they were less of debates and more um, fruitful conversations about the truth of the scriptures. And he continued to um, teach me and he gave me my first Bible that I still have. And um, eight months later, we were married. The other thing that really happened for me was the Lord released me from my fear of death. I'm no longer afraid of the day when I die. I can't wait to sit at the feet of my Heavenly Father and worship Him. And I just pray for all of you. I pray that, that you would seek and that you would find. I pray that you would study the Word because there is truth to be found there. And I just pray that Jesus would be glorified in me. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace today. I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit will touch the lives of your people who are listening at home, those who are sitting before you, and that you have met them where they are, that they will just open up their hearts to allow you to bring them where they need to be. Father, do the work that only you can do by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.